trying to hide it from me. <laughs> Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for being here. So I will start by telling you that when I was a little girl, I wanted to become an astronaut and explore space. However, very early on, I became short-sighted, as you can see. And that's really not good to become an astronaut. So that dream was broken. It wasn't easy. However, life allowed me to become a veterinarian and then a neuroscientist. So I had a chance to be able to explore other limits. The limits of knowledge about life, about biological processes, about how our brain functions. Brain is the coolest thing on Earth. It's what allows us to do everything. It allows us to talk, to laugh, to walk, to run, to think, to be happy, to be unhappy, to torture cockroaches, and I'm stopping here. <laughs> so we couldn't do anything without our brain. So it has been a fascinating journey. And interestingly enough, while I started my career in per Paris, in France, I managed to land on Jupiter. <laughs> So, I will need the first slide, please. Oh, I have to do it. <laughs> okay, I have to do something here. So, we're in a very interesting area of understanding the brain. For a long time, neuroscientists were trying to understand the function of brain areas by studying damaged brains. Pierre Broca, in the 19th century, he defined a region responsible for the production of language by studying the brain of a patient who couldn't articulate sentences. It's called expressive aphasia. And sadly enough, a lot of knowledge was gained from studying the brains of World War I soldiers that had received shrapnel in their heads. At the turn of the 19th century, Ramon y Cajal made beautiful drawings on neurons and on their connections. And he supported the idea that neurons are contiguous rather than being continuous. And that the functional unit of the brain is the neuron. Now, I don't know if you know that we have 100 billions of neurons in our brains. And this is almost impossible to imagine. So maybe that might help. If you would sit down here, have a timer in front of you, and start counting your neurons at a pace of one per second. Here is one, here is one, here is one, here is one. That's it. No. It would take you about 3,000 years to count them all. 3,000 years. So now, nowadays, we're not trying to understand brain areas anymore. We are trying to understand the fun function of each single neuron. And that's possible because there are new technologies such as laser scanning microscopy that allow us to visualize single neurons and their activity in the brain of a living animal. And we can even visualize the activity of molecules called proteins in the neurons at work. This kind of technology combined with genetic tools allows us to understand the function of specific types of neurons and how they're interconnected in three dimensions. And this is the type of work that researchers are doing at the Max Planck Florida Institute. Now, understanding how a neuron works and where it's located opens the door to understand what goes wrong in disease. What's wrong with that type of neuron? And where are they located, the neurons that are mal malfunctioning? I'm pretty sure that almost every one of you, if not everyone, knows closely somebody who has or has had either Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease. Five million people have Alzheimer's disease in the US alone and one million suffer from Parkinson's disease. 10% of people over the age of 65 have a neurological disease and that number is going to double by the year 2030. All the diseases I listed here, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, frontotemporal dementia, amyotrophic lacrimal sclerosis, and prion diseases, they're all due to the misfolding of a protein in our own brain. And I'm going to show you a little bit later what that means. Prion diseases are a very good model to study this group of neurodegenerative disease. Neurodegenerative means degeneration means death, progressive death, and neuro of, of neurons. 
They're a very good model because not only are there neurodegenerative diseases, but they're also infectious. So you can reproduce them in the laboratory. And to study something, you need to be able to model it. Prion diseases have been one of the biggest enigma in modern biology because nobody knew what they are caused by. Nobody could find any bacteria, virus, fungus, unicellular animal causing these diseases. However, they've been around for quite a while. In the 18th century already, Scrapie was described in sheep and then BAC, bovine spongiform encephalopathy. In humans, it's Kreutzer Jakob disease, CJD. Until in the early 80s, a researcher called Stan Prisoner was able to purify in infectious preparation. He purified, what did he purify? A protein. A protein is one type of molecule that we have everywhere. They're very busy molecule, they do a lot of stuff. So he thought, wow, that's the infectious agent. Let's call it a prion, a prion. That's the inverted anagram for proteinaceous infectious particle. Now it turned out that this infectious prion, that is infectious protein, is a constituent of our own brain. We all have lots of prion protein in our brains. So how can that be? How can it be that a constituent of our brain is at the same time a pathogenic agent? So what happens is that each protein, I, I told you, accomplishes a lot of function. They can be structural elements, they can catalyze biochemical reactions, they can transport other molecules, but to do that, they have to have a particular shape. This is very important. If they lose their shape, they lose their function. So this is the example of the prion protein, and you can see the shape, also called structure, with the three pink ribbons and the two yellow beta sheets. During the disease, what happens is that the, chain, the shape changes and the protein becomes misfolded. And this is very bad. When the protein becomes misfolded, it's toxic and it has a tendency to aggregate. So it self-assembles into the brain. It forms long fibrils that you're going to see in a moment. And these long fibrils make deposits in the brain that are called plaques. These plaques can be visualized under the microscope using particular stains, as you can see on this picture. Now, I told you this protein now has become toxic. So it makes the neurons sick, and the neuron starts have being full of these little holes that you can see. And this is why prion diseases are also called spongiform encephalopathies, because when you look at the brains under the microscope, they look like sponges. So now what you're going to see is a cow affected by, in a, in a minute, if the movie comes up. So, okay, you're not going to see the cow. <laughs> but you know how a cow looks like, oh yes, now. <laughs> So you see, this cow is affected by bovine spongiform encephalopathy. And I wanted to show you these clinical signs, which are tremors, aggressivity, and coordination of the, of the movements, which led this poor cow to fall down. So BSC started in 1985. The first case was discovered in the United Kingdom in April 85. The disease turned out to be an epidemic and was found in the whole United Kingdom and spread to continental Europe and to other countries. Some cases were discovered in Japan, Canada, and as you know, in the United States. The total number of cases worldwide is about 190 cases, 190,000 cases. However, even more importantly, it's been estimated that the total number of cows that were infected and entered the food chain before they had even the chance to develop the clinical signs was 4 million. So what happened? What happened is that probably in the late 70s, a cow developed a spontaneous form of BSC, like humans develop spontaneously CJD, mainly when they're over 65 years of age. That cow was recycled into mean and moan meal that was used to feed cows to, to increase their milk production. And so because at the end of the 70s, the production processes were changed and they lowered the temperature, the prions were not inactivated anymore. So get cows got contaminated by this meat and bone meal. And when they died, they become rendered again and entered into the food of new cows. So this is how the infectious agent was recycled in the cattle population leading to this epidemic.
And at the end of the food chain are humans. So in 1996, 10 cases of a strange form of Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease that was called variant CJD were reported in the United Kingdom. These cases occurred in abnormally young patients. I told you CJD is found mainly in people over 65 years of age, but teenagers had VCJD and they exhibited strange neurological signs. So at that time, nobody really knew what was this disease. And at that time, the experiments that I was doing in the laboratory provided the experimental evidence that BSC was a zoonosis that it had transmitted to humans and that VCJD was the expression of BSC in humans. The next bad news came in 2004. The disease is transmissible by blood transfusion. Only four patients got the disease by blood transfusion, which is enough, and one by um, receiving blood-derived products. However, this is still a major public health problem because we don't know how many people are infected and will develop the disease later on because the incubation period is very long. So, for example, to illustrate that it is a public health problem, you are not allowed to donate your blood in the United States if you stayed more than three months in the UK or five years in Europe between 1980 and 1996. So many researchers who come to the United States and come from Europe, they cannot donate their blood. So I told you I spent a lot of time in the laboratory trying to understand how prions replicate, how they propagate in the body, how they propagate from one organism to another. And some of the data generated helped craft some preventive public health measures. Now my laboratory is focused on trying to understand why and how are neurons dying and what new therapeutic approaches can we implement. So the functional unit of the brain is the neuron. A good, healthy-looking neuron has extensions called dendrites or axons, and a cell body and a nucleus that contains our DNA. The DNA is our genome. Now imagine that every single of these 100 billion neurons contains our entire genome, which is packaged into it. When a neuron gets sick, it loses its extensions and thereby its ability to communicate, which is not good for a neuron. That's his function, to communicate. And the, its metabolism becomes low. So it starts to accumulate junk. And it tries to contain the junk in little packages, in little pockets. They had the nice scientific word for that is vacuoles or phagosome, but they're actually garbage bags. <laughs> and when the, it, things become worse, and if the neuron is a cell culture, it completely loses its extension, becomes round, and full of these vacuoles. Now, in my laboratory, we established a model to understand why the neurons are dying and how they are doing that. So on the right, you see a picture of healthy, good-looking neurons. And if you expose them to the correctly conformed prion protein, they remain healthy, as you can see on the right. They have their extensions, no vacuoles. On the left, you can see the same type of neurons exposed to the misfolded form of the prion protein. And you can see that they exhibit all the signs of disease that I've described to you. They lose their extensions and they're full of vacuoles. So we've used this model and we've made quite some progress to understand the mechanism of neuronal death. And we also have evidence that it's actually possible to protect the neurons against the toxicity of the misfolded protein. We also implemented another approach based on the following. These mice were produced in the laboratory of Charles Weissman in the 90s, and they were genetically engineered to not produce any prion protein. So not only do they look smart and healthy, but they're also completely resistant to prion diseases. Not having the prion protein offers another advantage when you're a neuron. It also protects you against the toxicity of one of the proteins that is involved in Alzheimer's disease. So if you put this toxic Alzheimer's disease protein on neurons, only those here that have a lot of the prion protein will become sick, not the others. So based on these facts, together with Charles Weissman, we developed a new method to try to screen at very high speed for chemical compounds that could lower the amount of the prion protein on a neuron to protect that neuron. 
And together with my colleagues from the lead identification laboratory at Scripps, Florida, we identified a drug that does exactly that job. And you can see on the right, the neurons treated with the drug, they have much less prion protein labeled in, in green than the neurons, than the control neurons on the left. We've taken this drug and we treated mice experimentally infected with prion proteins and we were able to observe a delay in the development of clinical disease in these mice. So I've told you that we are now able to look into the brain, to look at the neurons, what they're doing, and with whom they are doing that. I've told you that we're able to model deadly malfunction and to try ways to prevent it. So I think that our future lies in therapies targeting disease processes, specifically in the affected neural population. This is a challenging future, but it's no longer out of reach. And I thought that this is an idea worth spreading. Thank you very much. Thank you.